idea that motion is just a change of position in time is a superstition. Motion is in fact a rotation of space-time, and realizing that may feel a little bit like a mental <laughs> but... Hello and welcome to my online course on special relativity. My name is Andrzej Dragan, I'm a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Warsaw and National University of Singapore. And my specialty is combining some of the most intriguing aspects of quantum theory with some of the most fascinating aspects of general relativity. So my usual elevator pitch is that I check out what happens if you perform a quantum teleportation in the proximity of the event horizon of a black hole. Which is a lot of fun. However, this course will be very simple and basic. I'm going to avoid all the sophisticated math, just doing some old-school, high-school algebra. So if you came here to learn relativity from scratch, you came to the right place. So the way I like to teach relativity begins with an idea that did not come from Einstein. In fact, it came from his teacher, Hermann Minkowski, who published that idea only one year before his death. And it was known at the time that light behaved in a very peculiar way. It always moved to the same speed. And that speed did not depend on the motion of the observer. So you could move towards the light, you could move away from the light, you could grab the source of light and move it around, and that motion did not affect the speed of light. And nobody really understood it. Nobody knew how to interpret it, and Hermann Minkowski was the guy who came up with a really cool interpretation of this fact. So let me show you what was so interesting about Minkowski's idea. So imagine a ray of light moving between two points, call them A and B, and let's introduce a coordinate system such that the coordinate distance between those points is delta x, delta y, and delta z. In this case, the length of the path between a and b is simply a square root of the sum of the squares of delta x, delta y, and delta z. And we can now express the fact that light moves with the speed c, the speed of light, by writing that the length of the path is simply equal to the speed of light multiplied by the time difference between those events a and b, let's call it delta t. Now let me take a square of both sides of the equation and take one of the terms on the other side of the equation so that the whole thing equals to zero. I can now apply this weird fact that we know from the experiment that light always moves with the same speed c by saying that we can introduce another frame of reference, another observer that is moving with an arbitrary velocity v and uh, in his primed coordinate system he can write the exact same equation with the same constant c. Now, mathematically speaking, what we have here is just two polynomials that have all the zeros in common, which means that if one of those polynomials is equal to zero, then so must be the other. And that means that these polynomials have to be simply proportional to each other with some proportionality factor k. This coefficient k can only depend on the relative velocity between those observers because there is nothing else to be dependent on. And uh, if we make a transition from the rest frame to the moving frame, we have to multiply the polynomial by the k of v. If you wanted to make the opposite transition, we would need to multiply the polynomial by k of minus v because simply that's the relative velocity between the moving frame and the resting frame. And this means that if we move back and forth, nothing can change, which means that the product of k of v times k of minus v has to be equal to 1. Notice now that our expressions only depend quadratically on the delta x, delta y, and delta z, so we could flip the sign of x, y, or z, and that would not change anything. Which means that uh, the coefficient k can only depend on the value of the velocity, not its orientation, not its direction which means that we can wipe out the vector symbols, and that gives us a very simple condition, k has to be either 1 or minus 1. And to determine which value is the correct one, we can simply consider a special case when those two frames are the same, when v is equal to 0, 
And in that case, clearly k has to be equal to 1, which means that we can just consider that solution. And that allows us to just wipe out the proportionality constant and leave the equality of both polynomials. And now let me introduce a new variable. I'm going to call it tau. And that variable will be simply product of c times t times square root of minus 1, which is an imaginary unit. So to some of you, this imaginary time tau can sound suspicious or mysterious, but there is nothing mysterious about it. This is just a mathematical trick. And we will use that trick to easily derive the transformation formulas between the resting observer and the moving observer. This is our goal. And after we finish, we will simply go back to the real variables, real time t, and get rid of the imaginary time tau. Okay, so let's plug in the new variable into the expression that we have. And that results in a very nice symmetric equality of two polynomials. And now the question is, what the hell does it mean? All right, so what we have just obtained is a very intriguing result. It shows some sort of equality of a distance between two points, but that distance is not defined in a three-dimensional space. It's defined in a four-dimensional space time because it involves both space and time and moreover our transformation formulas that we want to find preserve distances between those points and that observation will help us finding the transformation formulas so notice that this part of the equation is the square of the distance between two points on a two-dimensional plane this thing here is a distance between points in a three-dimensional space which suggests that this whole thing is simply a distance between two points in a four-dimensional space-time because it involves both time and space. Okay, so our goal is now to determine the transformation formulas characterizing the transition between the rest frame and the moving frame. And they will take the expression on the left-hand side, the unprimed expression, to the expression on the right-hand side, the primed combination of the squares of coordinates. So our goal is to guess that transformation based on this simple equation. Okay, guys, so we are in a bit of a luck because there are just a few operations that preserve distances between points. For instance, if I take the ruler and rotate it, the length doesn't change. If I shift it by a fixed distance, the length also doesn't change. I can also reflect it in a mirror and the length will stay the same. The distance between the endpoints will stay the same. And it turns out these are all operations and their compositions that preserve distances between points. That's all. But here's a problem. None of these operations seem to correspond to what motion really is. Because if I rotate myself, I'm not moving. I have just rotated my view and that's all. If I shift myself by a fixed distance, that's simply shifting the origin of my reference frame by a fixed distance. This is not moving. This isn't motion. If I reflect myself in a mirror, that's clearly not motion. So it seems that all the possible operations are rotations, translations, and reflections, or their compositions, but none of them seem to correspond to what motion really is. So we are a bit stuck here. But maybe we are missing something. And this is where the genius of Polish-born Minkowski really shined. Because he realized that there is one more possibility that we have missed. That motion is actually rotation, but within a plane that contains both space and time. A rotation of space-time. Okay, so suppose that the two frames of reference move along the common x-axis so that the rotation of space-time that we'll be looking at uh, takes place in a plane containing the x-axis and time tau. So the moving frame of reference will correspond to a rotated plane of x and tau, which we denote with x prime and tau prime. And the angle of rotation will denote with theta. Then the standard high school formulas for the rotation of the reference frame is given by this combination of trigonometric functions sine theta and cosine theta. 
We can also express sine and cosine functions in terms of a tangent of theta, and that will give us the following expressions. All right, so the next question is, what is this angle theta that appears in our equations? How does it relate to anything real? And uh, it has to do something with the velocity, a relative velocity between the frames. And uh, the next thing we want to do is to determine that relation. Now, the easiest way to relate theta with v is by saying that the origin of the moving frame of reference, given by the point x prime equal to zero, is moving in the rest frame according to the formula x equals t times t. And if you plug in both of those expressions into the second equation, we get the following relation between theta and velocity, which we can now plug in into the set of equations that we have. And that starts to look quite familiar. Okay guys, we are almost there. There is just one tiny step to be made to get the final result, and that's getting rid of the complex number that spoil our beautiful expressions. Now after going back to using t instead of tau, we finally get rid of the imaginary factor i from our equations, and that gives us the famous Lorentz transformation formulas, which are foundation of all relativity and everything that we will study from here will be just a consequence of these simple equations. And that's it. It's that simple. Shout out to Casey Neistat for this shot. However, the problem here is that I see stuff moving around, but I cannot see any rotation of space-time. So what's going on? So the reason why we do not see those crazy rotations of space-time when we move is very simple. My typical velocity when I move is of the order of 10 meters per second. And the speed of light equals 300,000 kilometers per second. So the ratio of those two is very, very tiny. And for all practical purposes, we can simply neglect the expressions v over c in our formulas. Now let's have a look at the Lorentz transformation formulas and see how they behave when we take the limit of v that is much smaller than c. In that case, we can actually neglect v squared over c squared in the denominator, and what we get is just the regular Galilean transformations, in which time does not change and motion is just change of position in time. Okay, so let's go back to our initial question, how to rotate space-time. And the answer it's surprisingly simple. All you have to do is just move. So my space time is now rotated, but that rotation is quite weird because it involves imaginary time, possibly an imaginary angle, and I have no idea what it means. So let's try to make it real. In order to express our complex rotation in terms of uh, real functions, let us rewrite again our equations, but instead of tau we will be using i times c times t. We can now use a relation between trigonometric functions and hyperbolic functions, cosine and sine, and the relation is quite simple, cosine theta is equal to cosine hyperbolic of i theta, while sine theta is equal to minus i times sine hyperbolic i theta. And instead of writing i theta, we can substitute curly theta. This time, these rotations are so-called hyperbolic rotations, where trigonometric functions are replaced with hyperbolic functions, cosine and sine hyperbolic. Now, the hyperbolic rotation has slightly different properties. Uh, in our space-time diagram, the axes of the moving frame of reference are not rotated in the same way. One of them is rotated clockwise, while the other is rotated anti-clockwise. And the angle of rotation is the same, let's call it phi. This essentially is a hyperbolic rotation of a plane con containing time and space. And our parameter phi is related to curly theta and velocity with the following formulas.
it. An idea that motion is just a change of position in time is a superstition or an approximation at best. Motion is in fact a rotation of space-time given by the Lorentz transformation. And realizing that may feel a little bit like a mental But once we embrace this idea, everything else about relativity becomes practically trivial. For example, if I grab a ruler and photograph it at an angle, it comes out shorter. For the same reason, moving bodies are also shorter because motion is just some sort of rotation of space-time. Space-time, which means that moving clocks will also be affected by their motion. And in fact, we'll find out that if a clock is moving, then its rate is slowed down due to its velocity. I'm going to discuss all of these things in detail in further episodes, but if you're curious already, get yourself a copy of my textbook on relativity. It's called Unusually Special Relativity. It's available on Amazon, the link is in the description. Also, if you like the video, you know the drill. But today the party is over, so get out of here. See ya.